Slack fits into a snap. The Department of Health cracks down on NHOS. Linus gives Intel some business. And VR on a budget. Mm, all that more coming up. Mm. That's right. It's another great day for Linux, everyone. Let's go. Welcome back to Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays, where we're going to sit back, relax, and talk about some of the fun things that we found going on in Penguin Land. And every single week, that's uh, my co-host, uh, the beautiful person in Britannia, one Pedro Mateus, which confuses YouTube commenters. It's like he's clearly talking with an American <laughs> accent. Why is he talking? Oh, why is he dressing pounds? America. I don't understand that either, but it's definitely a thing. I'm Vin Stone, old man Vin, you know me. Tolerate me, whatever. And um, we're about to get right into it. Anything, anything new going on? I know we're going to be talking uh, no, about the NHS. Really. Yeah, and I'm going to have to uh, be somewhat careful because there is a bit of a uh, policy in place about discussing things what happen at work. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, didn't have a, uh, I had uh, bank adventures. I'm going to say this. Good guy, SunTrust, uh, for speaking of pounds, cashing a check that I had, not cashing, depositing, because I opened an account with them. I liked it so much with no fees. That was made out in Britannia, Lamy currency. All right, so let's get right into this. Uh, earlier this week, Slack, it's a bit around, but this comes mm -hmm. from Ombuntu. You know it. And it's now got a snap pack. Is this a good thing? I don't know. I don't use Slack, Pedro. Honestly, neither do I. It is an Electron app, so it doesn't necessarily need to be in in a Snap or a Flatback or whichever package you want to use. It's an Electron app, and it's Slack. You know Slack. Chances are, if you've been on the internet, you've seen the articles on uh, Lifehacker, or Gizmodo, or whatever. Uh, you know what Slack is. It's basically Discord without the gaming. It's what sort of inspired Discord to become what it is with that UI layout, with no, no, the way I, that the rooms work and everything true, else. True, true. You, you say that, but I've witnessed Slack, and there's as many bots in tomfoolery, because this is our family-friendly show. Trust me, I would have used a different yeah. uh, <laughs> going on in Slack as there is in uh, Discord. Actually, some might argue more. but I Yeah, probably more, since it's been around longer. Mm -hmm. But it's a snapback. Uh, that's neat. I have, uh, I'm running 1710, uninstalled Snap until they get the loopback device thing, because th that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. It's a cosmetic issue, but it shows up in file management, and um, yeah, that, that needs to get sorted. But good on them, but we're not going to bury the lead. We are going to talk about the NHS. That's uh, something Pedro yes. knows a thing or two about. Yes, I do. I work for Health Education England, which is one of the uh, companies that is part of the NHS. And this story kind of rang a bell with me because I'm a Linux user in a world dominated by Windows. And turns out uh, there were a team or there was a team of people working on NH, uh, NHS Ubuntu, which then had to be rebranded to NHOS to escape a trademark, a possible trademark uh, lawsuit. Of course, uh, that was all for naught because the Department of Health lawyers cracked down on the team that was working on NHOS and they said, nope, uh, you're using the NHS uh, brand. Uh, it's highly recognizable. You can't do that. So it's a cease and desist. Mm -hmm. And they said, well, it's uh, it's the final straw, and they're kind of giving up on the project. Now, the project was actually a, a very good idea. Uh, the end goal was to have an operating system that could replace Windows and save the NHS a ton of money. And as long as everything that needs to work is working. But there is a big issue with the NHS, which is... There are a lot of smart cards, a lot of doctors, even people in health education England use smart cards. So you need to have that smart card functionality to interact with the NHS systems. And that was a bit of a problem. That's definitely a thing, man. And the team putting that together, it was basically four core members behind that. Mm -hmm. And what it would look what it read to me was um, not not being ageist, but a bunch of stodgy, ill-educated. <laughs> 
people were both angered and confused by Floss Software. We, we had a talk before we went live about some stuff. Yeah. It's like, yeah, it kind of seems like they are. But, you know, we can't really talk about that. Um, Pedro, what do you think about this? Because there's a bit of controversy about um, in the news lately in Britannia that the NHS not getting enough funding. And I, I think that mm-hmm. argument, not not politics at all, the argument of the NHS in these systems, it's not being underfunded when it's really just a spending wisely issue, maybe with this particular thing. But what kind of gets me about this is this is uh, what I titled in the show notes. This isn't Microsoft strikes again. This is just how they do business, man. But yeah, there's also the Microsoft argument, which the Register article mentions. As it turns out, NHS England was in talks with Microsoft about getting cheaper licenses. And when Microsoft finally caved, all of a sudden, the team that was working on NHS Buntu gets a cease and desist order. Now, Hanlon's razor teaches us not to attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by incompetence. And we all know that incompetence in the NHS is a very good thing. I mean, just look at Jeremy Hunt. He's still in charge of it. Mm. I don't know. Sad to see. And I honestly think this is something that they could have fought, you know, with a trademark issue, but I understand yeah. why they didn't. I am don't don't fault them at all. Because yeah, you don't yeah. want to, you don't want to go up against the government. That's always a bad idea. But speaking of the NHS, this is something I kind of ran across that was suggested when I was looking into this story. I just wanted to give a little love, a little bit of a plug, because it's hospital run. Mm-hmm. It's a free, easy-to-use software for developing world healthcare, and uh, it's offline enabled. That, that's why I wanted to give it a mention. Like, say you're in a place like Tanzania, and um, or any part of the developing world, and mm-hmm. how would you describe it, Pedro? Uh, you know more about this than I do. This is a. It's uh, it's built on Node.js, or sorry, Ember.js, my bad, uh, and it works offline. That's the big selling point. You, you still need a browser or something that can render uh, JavaScript, uh, but it works completely offline, and when you go online, it syncs up with the uh, uh, cloud service, whatever you're using to store the database, and it keeps a local copy, which makes it very, very easy for, say, a doctor that goes out into Africa, somewhere where internet's just not a thing for miles and miles on end, and still have access to all of their patient files, their clinical histories, everything. It's all there, and it's got a a nice GUI, because it works, you know, it's like a web page, and it presents everything very neatly, and it's just a good idea all around. I I like it. I like that it's open source and it will probably be met with yeah. roughly the same type of resistance, um, not necessarily from Microsoft, <laughs> but from the companies just making all the money with that locked in specialized software. Yeah. That's when the price uh, kind mm-hmm. of hockey sticks a lot of the time. So, hey, mm-hmm. that's out there. If you know anybody uh, in that particular situation, I think uh, Open EMR is suggested by Friedrich. That's also a thing as well. Um uh, mm-hmm. That's that. We need to talk about 415, though. Oh, yes. Let's get on to the kernel. Mm -hmm. Because we we know that uh, 415 is right around the corner. We've seen all the uh, announcements about uh, there's a new release candidate. Go out and test it. Well, uh, turns out we need another release candidate, RC9. uh, Because Linus uh, had some issues with the latest kernel. Uh, There was a particular bug which was causing certain machines to just not boot uh and a couple of other patches that also made their way into the um the kernel which we will talk about in a moment uh but yeah they, he said that he wasn't comfortable uh putting out something that wasn't done uh and he's far more comfortable with adding another uh, release candidate on top of just releasing something that's busted. I don't have a problem with this, man. This is great. This is don't test in production. And, you know, considering yeah. the absolute <laughs> shite storm at Spectre and WannaCry and all that, an extra RC, I, I genuinely came to that. It's like, I'm not even mad, bro. It's go, go for it. I'm happy on 414, whatever it is this week, 13, or I don't know. 
Uh, mm-hmm. I'm looking forward to it. I understand. It was like, no, I guess the news is just the release cycle, but the, yeah. <laughs> clearly understandable why you don't want to um, rush things, giving the current environment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's a particular uh, thing that makes this current environment all the more fun, especially if you like Linus's rants. <laughs> mm-hmm. Because, uh, <laughs> Oh, I'm just going to say this. Linus is my spirit animal. Um, Oh, yeah. (laughs) Linus Torvald slams Intel Spectre and Meltdown fixes as garbage. And that's the nice thing he said. uh, If you want to look (laughs) at this, Uh, because uh, you you just got to love the straightforward, uncensored comments from Linus uh, when it comes to garbage being published in the kernel, because he does not hold back. He throws it down. He is a benevolent dictator, which is true. Uh, he takes a swipe at a former Intel engineer and basically, uh, is this an incorrect assumption when I'm going to say this, Pedro? He, he's like, listen, a simple software patch is not set it and forget it. This is not going to be the permanent fix. This is not how we're going to do it. This is going to involve microcode and doing it right. Yeah. And it was, uh, the, the issue was also the fact of how Intel was trying to work Uh, around without actually fixing the Spectre and Meltdown exploits. That was the big sticking point for Linus, because as he kind of punctuated, it's like, as it is, the patches are complete and utter garbage. And uh, he also says that's actually ignoring the much worse issue, namely that the whole hardware interface is literally misdesigned by morons. He just called Intel morons. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, yeah but i mean come on he was he I, i'm shocked after seeing how uh, warm and cuddly he was with nvidia pedro whatever you do mean i oh yeah mm-hmm. absolutely <laughs> he painted he painted nvidia pretty picture uh now he's painting intel an even prettier one uh let's just say well he also painted amd a pretty picture when they tried to introduce that hardware abstraction layer mm-hmm. yeah remember that <laughs> Well, um, Intel's got a lot of problems, and AMD's got some problems, too, 100%. And Red Hat kind of took notice of that, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. And, well, if you haven't heard, turns out that the Spectre patches are causing issues. If you have a Haswell or a older Intel CPU, you may be stuck in a boot loop. And as it turns out, uh, servers don't get new hardware all that often. If it works, don't fix it, right? No, no, so... you're, you're supposed to install the latest. That, see, uh, Strider, <laughs> Strider in our um, chat uh-huh. is uh, <laughs> the reason that developers do not make good sysadmins. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, as it turns out, uh, servers running older Intel chips were outright bricking with the Spectre patches, and that's a big no-no. So Red Hat said, you know what? No, we're not having Mm. any of this. And they just pulled the patches, and they literally said, Intel, that they need to fix this before we even try to uh, uh, apply any more patches coming from them. And it's uh, it's a really bad past couple of months to be Intel. Everything that's been mounting up and it just culminates on production box servers, just outright not working. We're also going to look at this, man. Patches. I mean, this is not just Red Hat. Dell announced it was either yesterday or this morning. Mm-hmm. Dell's like, quit installing these patches, dude. Oh, that's a throwback for old people <laughs> like me. Um, just to straight up avoid them because it's not happy fun times right now. And listen, this mm-hmm. is a wicked serious issue. Despite what Wintel is telling you. Everyone knows Windows and everyone knows Intel. So we're calling them Wintel. It's like, um, what was some celebrity marriage mashup thing? Just play, just roll with it. Get back to me. Uh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) They're trying to get everyone to believe, you know, this is not going to be sorted with a few simple patches on the software side, as I was saying earlier. And ARM, ARM by itself is probably like the only chip maker that I've seen remotely doing the right thing here. I mean, their patches been a little bit buggy they have been performance heavy in a negative way but at least they're Mm -hmm. being transparent about it and they're like yo some things are broken unlike what intel is and and, (laughs) intel's like poof smokescreen 
And AMD yeah. is relying on the time honored tradition of like, we're not saying anything until something really blows up, <laughs> which is a valid yeah, strategy. Put out one official statement, right? One, yeah. One. Let's just go radio silence and hope this blows. This is not blowing over people. Um, <laughs> And don't let anyone convince you that meltdown is an Intel only problem. I mean, mm -mm, because it is. I'm just messing with you. It also affects, uh, well, no, it just affects Intel at all. Because I've seen a lot of people out there saying, but it affects ARM too. And you know what? It affected one chip. One. That wasn't even released. That chip's not out yet. So... Yeah. Yeah. And that was co designed by Intel. You can put two and 13 together in that by yourself and draw your own conclusions. Yeah. Not defending <laughs> ARM. I'm just saying I believe ARM has handled this more transparently. And with a serious issue like this, that's probably the good way to do it. it don't, don't do the time honored mm-hmm. uh, tactic mm-hmm. of, you know, smokescreen, poof, and um, get that sorted. So, Pedro, yep. this next thing coming up is um i I, i'm going to end up playing with this because this is so neat Mm -hmm. but man i can i have been racking my brain for two days trying to figure out why in the world i would need to run windows applications on android Ah, there's probably someone that is desperately trying to do that for one reason or another uh it's more of the current implementation now this was bound to happen we all knew it was coming. There were plenty of emulators out there that let you sort of emulate x86 um, on Android. But there was nothing like Wine. Well, Wine is now available for Android. Uh, there's a first alpha, well, the first alpha release came out in August 2016, and they've been improving it considerably. But currently, it still doesn't translate Direct 3D into OpenGL or OpenGLES. Wait, 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 wait. Are you trying to tell me I won't be able to play Fallout 4 on my phone? Uh, No. They're just completely Uh, useless. They they just need to stop the project right now. I mean, it... uh... (laughs) You'll probably be able to play No Man's Sky if you have a big honking tablet that can actually handle that because that's an OpenGL game. (laughs) You know, right now, somebody is out there as we are live trying to get Skyrim <laughs> running on this because they were too cheap to buy a Switch, which I respect. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, the new NVIDIA tablet K1s. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I say new, they're like two years old now. But uh, those are like 200 bucks, 180 pounds a pop. So, yeah. <laughs> I think it's neat Some keep an eye on because really like serious, serious talk is it's a good idea to get started started with this type of stuff because definitely mm-hmm. in like five years oh yeah i don't i hate saying 10 years because the future has always been 10 years away like five plus years the whole you know you take your mobile you stick it in a dock bam you know add water yeah. you have a desktop rig that is going to become a thing it is going to get there eventually and uh it'll be good to be prepared and that's the thing yep. regardless moral of the story support code weavers you know, yeah, yeah, because they definitely do great job. So, uh, what do we got? Oh, nightmare fuel. I don't like this. This is scary. Yes, I'm not talking about the project. <laughs> I'm talking about the concept of doing it. Build your own VR headset for 100 wet, stinky caches. We couldn't afford an Oculus, so we built one. That's going after my own heart. Uh, however, uh-huh. <laughs> however, I like to keep the ratio of things that I personally built that are end up strapped to my face organ. That, that magic ratio is zero to zero, not to not for me, because that's kind of dangerous. But they stuck this thing together with an Arduino uh, display, mm-hmm. some lenses, and quite a bit of time. That looks 3D printed. Uh-huh. Yes, yes, it does. <laughs> I guess uh, the cost doesn't really uh, add to it the cost of a 3D printer. That can actually make something that won't snap the moment you put those rubber straps on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, it's a cheap VR headset. It's a very low resolution, probably very barf inducing uh, VR headset, but it's cheap. And if they can improve on like the tracking of the movement of the head and get a higher resolution screen still on the cheap, that will probably make a very big difference. And hey, 
if you're going into the VR quote unquote market, emphasis on the quotes, uh, yeah, probably starting at the cheap, um, low cost, whatever you want to call it, uh, route is the way to do it. I think. Yeah, I see a lot of people in chat. It's like, uh, use a cardboard note. That does require a mobile phone. And unless you're living in Freedom America, mm -hmm. you're going to be buying everything off contract. So that's, you know, you're looking at five to 700 of your local currencies as your initial investment. And this yeah. is the type of things that you end up making that are really neat. They take a lot of time, low on resources, not necessarily for gaming. This is to kill some time, learn some new things because you're not of the legal mm -hmm. drinking age. And well, this is what you do. I've been there. Trust me. True story. I, I say good on them. And hey, man, may, might be good to introduce like to a class or at your local makerspace if you have that. Yeah. And get people interested. So I heard about this OBS Studio 21 Not One update. And I was like, meh, mm -hmm. update. Then they said, we added numbers to the VU meters. <laughs> you, sir, have my attention. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not all OBS. What is an open broadcast studio? It's on Linux is what we're using right now to switch this business. They've added Python scripting. So that is just, that's kind of a um, terrifying thoughts about what I can start doing with that. That's using uh, Python three support is there. They've got a multi-view projector. They've lowered uh, some of the G well, CPU usage for uh, your preview scenes, but a usable mm -hmm. VR meter hashtag squee will wonders Never cease praise flying spaghetti monster. And they have a gang of additional updates and fixes, not just for Linux, but for Mac and to a lesser extent windows. Um, I will say this is interesting way to do the video meter. Uh, if you know anything about audio, mm -hmm. which I barely know things about audio, but I know a little bit, I know, uh, not zero db is not clipping that that's called unity and that's where green should be not where clipping ends but they did it their way it's just nice to have an actual number level i'm looking at it right now and um you know what pedro give me your thoughts on it i'll show the people at home what it looks like yeah, well, it's OBS. Chances are you've probably tinkered with it. Look, there's a floating window right there. As I'm talking, you can see the thing moving. That's neat. That's the new feature. And yeah, we are using OBS to stream this right now. And I use OBS to capture the game footage that you usually see on Linux Gamecast Weekly during the review. It's exactly what Linux users want. It's the, that kind of software that we've been clamoring for for years. It's developed in parity for Windows and Mac and Linux. And they do it without resorting to nasty tricks or wrapping it in wine or building an Electron app, Discord. Uh, <laughs> but that is the kind of stuff that if you're building a native app, which works really well, regardless of what operating system you're using, Linux users are more than happy to use it. And if you do what OBS did and you make the studio variant open source, not only do you get Linux users using it, you get Linux users contributing to it. You get Linux users fixing it, expanding on it, doing loads and loads of stuff for the exact same price that you're putting out your software. Mm -hmm. For free. It's a good piece of kit. Jill, I agree with you. And I'm also looking at you, um, developer behind Pavu Control. Why don't we have actual numbers that would be nice but yeah it's good we're running it it seems stable i we made a script if you want to get the latest and greatest forever ago it's uh you can check out lutris do a search mm -hmm. for it on the internet or it was in um their ppa i added the uh yep and it's not obs's directly i don't believe it is but it's the obs PPA. it is now oh it is now <laughs> All right. Well, that, yeah. uh, that's good to know. That that got updated. It works. It's not crashy. We've done two streams with it. So good on that business. So Pedro, mm -hmm. we don't read like five or six ads in one hour, right? No, we do not. Do you and know that is because I was going to say, man, um, do, do you want to start doing that? Uh, given the option? No, mm, no. Um, no, I, I know I can be a bit of a shill sometimes, but mm -hmm. no, I'd rather not read ads. Uh -huh. But what, what, what if they're from Microsoft? 
<laughs> you know, that depends on how big that check is. We're, we're only half joking, ladies and gentlemen. There's a long running thing on the um, gaming show we do Saturdays. It's like, we'll never do ads unless we can talk Microsoft into sponsoring the show because it'll be fun to just dump on Microsoft for an entire show. Um, who we need to thank are our beautiful, gorgeous party patrons keeping us away from those ads. Ooh, yeah. This is our main source of financing. For not only this show, but for the Tuesday stream, Thursday stream, and that nightmare we do that is completely not safe for work every Saturday night. That's why we call it a Saturday night train wreck. 112 patriots kicking us. 233. Getting a little Irish on me. Um, <laughs> what stinky caches. And uh, you get access to a bunch of cool things that we have that unlock up to and not including, well, actually including our Discord chat where we like to hang out the other six days of the week. But reason we want to bring this up is because we get to think some of the new people and some of the people who've oh, been yes. around uh give a little shout out who, who do we got this week man who do we got this week we have uh scott michaud our second favorite canadian as increased his pledge thank you very much scott see here's the uh, thing about have... um scott my all the all the respect i got for scott is he short-circuited pedro with canadian kindness <laughs> On Twitter. <laughs> He's just way too Canadian for me. <laughs> Pedro didn't know what to do. He was used to dealing with Jordan, and he thought he was going to pick an internet yeah. fight. And Scott's like, nah, man, everything's cool. Uh, peace and love. It's like, ah, and just stormed off. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, we also have the Targos. We backed us at the executive producer level. Thank you very much, the Targos. The Targos, man, uh, check that have... business out. Let's see. Yep. Oh, let's see there he is. Yeah. <laughs> he is in the Discord. I don't think he's online right now, but uh, he is every now and then. Uh, and we also have Freedom Penguin. That name sounds familiar. Does it have a certain Matt Hartley behind it? Yeah, maybe it's Matt Hartley, either that or it's something far <laughs> more devious. Somebody asked that on the Patreon. So it's like, yes. could this possibly be Matt Hartley? It's like, kind of hope it is. Uh, it's a thing. Check it out, <laughs> yeah. freedompenguin.com. And we want to welcome back. Grayson has returned. Woohoo! That's super cool. Uh, before we get into the slice bite, we, we want to prepare everyone for this. Got a big announcement next week. So, Ooh, it's kind of big. Ominous. It's going to, uh, we, we've got some new goals. Starting the new year off late because we're us. And, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, we're dance monkey dance. It's, we're doing what we can with what we got, kids. And, um, but what we got in store is hopefully going to be pretty cool and everyone's going to enjoy it and look forward to it and make it happen. So let's dive into a slice of 3.14. whatever. Uh, well, this is a facial recognition. It's not exactly a module. It's a bit of a contraption that, uh, Deku Nukem built uh, it's a used a Raspberry Pi 3 and the Raspberry Pi camera module along with an OLED uh, screen to give you some output as to what you're doing. And what it does is facial recognition. It takes a 400 by 400 picture of your face and they highly recommend that you have a well-lit, see, well-lit room so that the picture is as crystal clear as possible. And from that base picture that's how it works the facial recognition and that's how it can do all of its magic you want to set it to unlock your machine when you walk close to it or you sit down at your chair you can mm. you want to do i don't know creepy spying on your neighbors you could do that too hi nsa <laughs> that, that's everyone's first thought is like why would i put a device in my house that would spy on it's like do you have many of those I already own are you kidding me like, then again you know we're semi you have an android phone Right. Um, no, uh, I thought interesting use case would be, hey, get up and walk around and jump around notifications or something. You, you've been sitting down too long. Move. It's like that thing better be easy to cut off. Um, or it could remind you to drink some water because if you didn't have a device to remind you to drink some water, you would die because you're a retard. Um Or it could be like, hey. Don't do crack. You know, just a friendly reminder. Don't do crack cocaine. It might mm-hmm. might not be um, conducive to good health. So that's neat. Something to play with. Uh, a billion uses, I'm sure. So, yeah, Beowulf cluster of pie, man. We've had a couple of people oh, yeah. 
stick them together before, but this is that seven is massive. hundred <laughs> and fifty Pi threes in a single box pulling four kilowatts of power. And it's it's all in a single box, man. I'm really impressed by that because back in my day, you know, we made uh, clusters of like Mac G fours and PlayStations. This is the new sauce. This is what the kids are playing with. And I, mm-hmm. th- this is above my pay grade. I don't even know what would uh, what, what what's our use case for uh, this man? Uh, use case. Well, uh, let's see. If you ha- want to have like a render farm at your work, and you have all those Raspberry Pis laying around, chances are this is going to make at least the uh, hardware logistics considerably easier. You'll still need to figure out the software, but hey, it's a Raspberry Pi. It's what you're there for. Uh, and the case looks really good. It, it that's a very striking, very professional looking. Uh, thing that just holds 750 Raspberry Pis. What was it? Like 35 U? <laughs> when you think about it, that's still kind of impressive. Heat dissipation might be an yeah. issue, but you yeah, know. yeah, you're going to need a lot of fans. <laughs> I, I I think HVAC systems come into play here, man. You, you need to keep that thing like solidly yeah. refrigerated. <laughs> uh, crypto mining. They do have some possibly. fans at the back. No. Oh yeah. Oh uh, well. Crypto mining, even with 750 Raspberry Pis, is probably going to be inefficient. You'd probably um, better off with your but... Athlon MP system for crypto mining if we're going to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh, no, if you are doing any type of threaded rendering, computing, what have you, that you need all of those nodes and you need them to work individually to process each job, but as a whole to build bit of software to render a movie whatever it is that is actually really good and it's probably priced stupidly expensive because it looks it see pedro does a <laughs> much better very job good, so it's very expensive of explaining this because it's like Vin, why does this exist why did you build this and it's like because i could <laughs> like, yeah done i'm out so um <laughs> Pedro, we live off everyone's feedback. If they have thoughts, hints, allegations, things we got wrong, sometimes we get right, or just uh, maybe something they want us to cover, or just chit chat, mm-hmm. something going on. How can they uh, go about getting the communication line so we can read it out on the show and offer our unbiased opinions? Well, if you see us walking down the street, you can throw a tin can at our heads tied to a string and then just chat into that tin can, but probably. Since you're watching this show on the interwebs, you just go to our web zone, that's linuxgamecast.com, and you hit the little contact button, you fill in the form, make sure to uh, select LWDW from the drop downy bit, that's all that matters, and your feedback will feature right here, right now. Unless it's something that we can just answer on the spot, and you're probably looking for an answer right then and there, then we'll get right back to you, but if you just want to leave some feedback, as Ven said, something we got wrong or got right that you'd like to expand on it by all means and let us know and the targos we talked about him earlier he gave us some mm, patreon love uh and he also uh apparently you, watched you, the show last week do and- you want to summarize this because this is like two novellas <laughs> <laughs> yeah it is uh, a bit big but yeah, it's uh, it's about the Barcelona um, story that we talked about last week, that Barcelona is dropping LibreOffice to start with, and their plan is to eventually get to uh, using full Linux. And he's actually talking about the Office thing. And I specifically mentioned uh, the whole, oh, using Excel and the macros is probably not going to work in LibreOffice if they're changing stuff between municipalities. And he brings that up. Uh, there are plugins and certain things that you can only do with Microsoft Office itself. If you, say, use LibreOffice, you use Google Docs or WPS Office because you're that person, uh, you will probably be able to replicate much of that same functionality, but that does not mean compatibility. So that is still going to be an issue, and he... Uh, he literally ends it saying that there were differences in the precision of calculations of uh, between Excel and Calc. That's back from the Office mm-hmm. 2003 days uh, between Windows and Linux. Hope that has been sorted out. And to the most 
point, as far as I know, it has, because LibreOffice Calc is actually a very good spreadsheet application. Go figure. <laughs> no, that's good to know. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. And because for the most part, we're like you. And we don't know everything. So a little bit of corrections, a little mm -hmm. inside knowledge. You know, I remember we had uh, someone from Charter who works at Charter. He's like, here's your problem, buddy. And the, it's always fun to find out stuff like that. Yeah, alternatives with the Floss ecosystem, it can be hit or miss. An argument could be made yeah. is it's kind of a vicious cycle because, yeah, all right, let's say you are based on Excel and you know 100%, 100%, and you have a soulless corporation backing that guarantee that everything, the numbers are going to get crunched correctly. So it mm -hmm. can be a hard sell. This is something people don't think about all the time is the higher ups are like, okay, if this thing breaks, who do we sue? <laughs> mm, you yeah, laugh. liability right. is a big thing. <laughs> mm, that can be a thing in open source. So uh, that's kind of like being the boss. The responsibility is on you. Okay, beautiful people, that's yep. going to wrap us up for this week's Linux Weekly Daily Wednesdays. Uh, we will have the live stream uncut version for patrons up a little bit later. And the MP3 podcast mm -hmm. for your ears, linuxgamecast.com. It's in the streams feed. And thank everyone again. Also, special thanks to everyone who's been ordering uh, the Humble Bundles. Like If you go to our support page, we get a little Humble thing. And double thanks to everyone ordering through Amazon affiliate links. That adds, add, that adds up. That is starting to become a little yeah. bit of a secondary income thing for us, and that's very important. So how about we roll them credits? Hmm? Ooh, yes. Because all you lovely people that put up with us, I mean, for some reason, you thought it was a good idea that Saturday show uh, what we do and you thought, you know what? We, no, I they really don't. Like Pedro, quit that. lying. <laughs> listen, this entire really thing. I really like to see those guys. Every time something disappears off of our wish list, I, I just collectively add to, okay, this is this is a practical joke on me that has gotten out of hand and no one is brave enough to tell me yet. Well, uh, your first clue would have been the pink chair that Truggy got you. I specifically <laughs> asked for a pink chair. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is true. <laughs> hey, listen, man. I, I'll... 102! 102! We're getting there. 102. Next week, two years, baby. Oh, yeah! Well, week after. <laughs>